and uh, welcome everyone. It's good to see you, especially those that are joining us the first time. Um, so I'm going to talk about half an hour or so and then um, turn it over to discussion, which is always my favorite part of these uh, presentations. So as James uh, noted, the title of my talk is what is existential psychoanalysis. Um, I don't know that I can really give you a, a satisfying definition of it, but uh, I guess that's why I need to take at least half an hour to talk about it a little bit. So to begin with, uh, we all know that there's many kinds of psychotherapy today, way too many uh, to list or differentiate. But today I want to explore what I think the term existential psychoanalysis entails. Now, at first blush, this is apparently an integration of psychoanalysis and a philosophical school, existentialism. Now, this is a rare thing. Freud invented psychoanalysis and, of course, psychotherapy. And while he was alive, he defined what psychoanalysis is, both in theory and practice. But since Freud's death in 1939, there have been many versions or schools of psychoanalysis that followed, typically named after the analyst with whom a specific school is identified. So for example, Kleinian or Bionian, or Winnicottian, or Cahusian, or Lacanian psychoanalysis are named after Klein, Bion, Winnicott, Kohut, or Lacan. Included among them is the Freudian school, to which I am loosely identified. But there are also schools or trends in the evolution of psychoanalysis that are more general and difficult to define. These include object relations theory, ego psychology, self psychology, attachment theory, or relational psychoanalysis, none of which are necessarily identified with one analyst in particular. So all of these so-called schools of psychoanalysis are recognized by the principal psycholytic accrediting organization founded by Freud, the International Psycholytic Association, or IPA as it's commonly known, that's based in London where Freud died. I'm also affiliated with the IPA through the uh, Psycholytic Institute of Northern California. Unlike all the other schools that I just listed, existential psychoanalysis is not recognized by the IPA as a bona fide school of psychoanalysis. You could say that it's a renegade school, originally conceived by an existential philosopher, Jean-Paul Sartre, who was not even a therapist. Yet there are numerous, numerous existential schools of psychotherapy as distinct from psychoanalysis that were conceived by various psychiatrists, psychologists, and lay therapists including many psychoanalytically trained practitioners. A sampling of these schools include existential analysis, existential therapy, Dasein analysis, existential humanistic therapy, logotherapy, and so on. I think you get the drift. What all these types of existential therapy share in common is that the term psychoanalysis is explicitly avoided and even rejected. Why? The term existential is derived from the word existentialism, a school of philosophy that has its roots uh, in the 19th century philosophers Soren Kierkegaard and Friedrich Nietzsche, and subsequently emerged fully formed in the 20th century under the aegis of Martin Heidegger, Jean-Paul Sartre, Maurice Merleau-Ponty, and a number of other philosophers. They were all virtually European, which makes sense because philosophy after all was born in Europe. The reasons why an existential school of psychoanalysis never officially gelled 
are complex. But the most unavoidable problem is that psychoanalysis and existentialism are two separate disciplines. One is a form, the original form of psychotherapy initiated by Freud, whereas existentialism is a fairly recent school of philosophy. Freud argued that psychoanalysis is derived from psychology, not philosophy or even psychiatry. Psychology is a science of the mind or behavior, whereas philosophy employs the mind in order to pursue wisdom, seeking the optimal way to live. These two disciplines embody wildly differing objectives and are not interchangeable, so integrating them is not easy. To do so compels us to question the very efficacy of psychology as a proper foundation for psychoanalysis and whether it is even a bona fide science. Now, Freud conceives psychoanalysis as a treatment method. And while not derived from psychiatry, he did conceive it as a tool of psychiatry, which is a medical discipline. He explicitly disavowed psychoanalysis as a philosophy. And yet his voluminous books and papers that outline the vicissitudes of psychoanalytic theory, comprising 23 volumes of books and papers, more or less consist in a wise step-by-step -step methodology for the pursuit of happiness, the same goal as philosophy. Wouldn't this render the two disciplines, philosophy and psychoanalysis, perfectly compatible, even kissing cousins? But what about all those schools of psychotherapy that are depicted as existential in their orientation? How do they differ from what I'm characterizing as an existentially based psychoanalysis? Existentialism became fashionable in the post Second World War era, first in Europe, and then gradually across the Atlantic to North America. As an adjective for existence, the word existential was popularized by Jean-Paul Sartre after the publication of his magnum opus, Being and Nothingness, first published in France in 1943, two years before the end of the war. Though Sartre did not invent the label, it was Sartre with whom existentialism is most identified. Le existentialism became the rage in Paris and served to epitomize the hip, bohemian, Parisian cafe set of intellectuals, artistes, and vagabonds who ushered in an age of nonconformity, a kind of societal and intellectual rebellion against chains, first imposed by the Germans during the Nazi occupation of France, then by any form of orthodoxy that presumed to dictate what people should believe and how they should behave. Paris became a philosophical culture and le existentialism dripped from the lips of anyone who longed to be a member of the chic avant-garde set of Parisian society to which everybody who pretended to be in the know wanted to belong. Sartre was also fascinated with both Freud and psychoanalysis and devoted a significant portion of being in nothingness to an existential version of Freud's treatment method. Though Sartre made existentialism famous, it anticipated him by more than a century by Kierkegaard and Nietzsche, who I mentioned earlier. Both philosophers were opposed to the intellectualization of traditional philosophy, epitomized by yet another German philosopher, Hegel. Kierkegaard and Nietzsche sought to counter Hegel's abstractness by focusing on the more personal aspects of the human condition, especially focusing on the nature of anxiety. The 20th century philosopher Martin Heidegger subsequently became the most important thinker in the existential tradition due to the volume of his output, the radical nature of his ideas, and his emphasis on the role of existence in everyday life. 
Sartre's main philosophical work, Being a Nothingness, is an almost verbatim French version of Heidegger's magnum opus, Being and Time, published in 1927, which deals with concepts such as freedom, anxiety, and authenticity. But it was Sartre who popularized existential philosophy and turned it into a cultural phenomenon that in turn brought Kierkegaard, Nietzsche, and Heidegger to the non-academic public's attention for the first time. So what is existentialism? What can we say about the existential perspective or sensibility given the many philosophers that are associated with it? Because there is no orthodox encapsulation of what it means, I can only tell you what it means to me. Every philosophical perspective has its nomenclature, terms that set it apart from others, though there is often some overlap. This is no less true for existentialism. The words I most readily associate with this perspective, though not exhaustive, are the following. So I'll begin with the word experience, a word we use every day. Experience is privileged in existential thinkers because it is inherently personal and not an abstract and academic aspect of philosophy, which is what sets it apart from other philosophies. Though this sometimes makes existential philosophy more accessible to the layman, Heidegger as being in time is often considered the most difficult philosophical work ever written. Whatever else the existential perspective embodies, it is primarily concerned with my way of seeing things, which is the only way of seeing things that I have direct access to. The concept of experience was a favorite of R.D. Lang's and so important to him that it was included in the title of two of his books, The Politics of Experience and The Voice of Experience. Now, experience is closely associated with another term that you see frequently employed by existentialists, but by no means exclusively, the word meaning. Things matter to me, which is another way of saying the world I live in means something to me. What it means is up to me to determine, and only I can do so. The search for meaning, specifically what my life is about, is probably the most basic topic explored in both existential therapies as well as in psychoanalysis, each of which sees the therapeutic process as one of getting to know yourself in the most penetrating way possible. Another is the term authenticity. All existentialist thinkers promote authenticity over inauthenticity, but there is little agreement as to what authenticity is. By the way, that's the subtitle of my uh, book that's coming out. First and foremost, authenticity is a way of articulating what it means to be honest with oneself. Honesty was also highly valued by Freud. And one could argue that he promoted authenticity in his patients' lives via the act of free association, disclosing whatever comes to mind in each therapy session. Both psychoanalysis and existentialism are concerned with becoming the person that you are by dropping the pretenses we typically employ to please others. This is probably the single most feature of both these disciplines that have made them so controversial. Each acts as subversive elements in society by helping its citizens to separate themselves from the status quo. No group well relishes a group member pissing on what that group is about, which explains why groups are conservative in nature. They seek to perpetuate the status quo. 
Perhaps this explains why existentialism are usually fiercely independent and mistrust groups as a rule. One of the things that I loved about Lang's group in London, the Philadelphia Association, is that there was no status quo. Lang often depicted it as a group of misfits who didn't belong in any other group. Free Association, our group, was founded on this premise. Authenticity is also closely linked to the existentialist preoccupation with freedom. This is a complicated and generally misunderstood concept. Like authenticity, various existential thinkers differ in how they see it. For the most part, to be free in the existential sense is to realize that I choose to be who I am at the deepest, most basic level of my being. Now, I usually deny this, a common problem in psychotherapy. This doesn't mean I'm always conscious of my choices, since they typically operate beneath awareness. This implies that I have agency in my actions, that I am behind my acts, impressions, and attitudes about the life that I live, and therefore that I'm alone responsible for who I am and what I do. Nobody made me the way that I am. I even choose my neuroses. A man in prison has lost nearly all his freedom, but he nonetheless chooses how he reacts to being a prisoner, whether to become embittered or to improve himself or to escape, for example. Yet another term that is closely associated with the existential perspective is the German word angst. Now we typically translate this as anxiety in English, but angst can also mean dread or anguish. Human beings are inherently anxious, and this is a fundamental aspect of our being. This is similar to Freud's contention that each of us is anxious from birth and relentlessly seeks to minimize our anxiety as much as we can by suppressing our desires. Though the terminology adopted by existential philosophy and psychoanalysis differ, their respective ways of privileging anxiety as an ongoing problem with which all of us grapple are complementary. For the most part, they both agree that anxiety is a good thing and that we need to learn how to attend to it and accommodate it rather than suppressing or minimizing it. Naturally, when we suffer anxiety, we instinctively want to suppress it. But existentialism and psychoanalysis, like Buddhism, embrace suffering as a vital constituent to life that begs to be understood. For the most part, we fear anxiety and want to sedate it. So the last word that I associate with existentialism is alienation. Yet another term that is not used exclusively by existentialists. We humans are inherently estranged from while inescapably rooted in our environment. Alienation is also a key theme in Marxism, but for different reasons. Marx argued that our alienation in society is due to the inequity of social classes and economic privilege. Existentialists attribute our alienation to the encroaching power of technology that threatens to turn people into machines. Though this problem originated in the Industrial Revolution, it is also a popular theme among science fiction writers, such as Philip K. Dick, who explored how the distinction between humans and machines may disappear in the not too distant future. In a world, says Dick, where machines are more human than humans. And now AI is the biggest topic on the internet. Some thinkers, including George Orwell, and Aldous Huxley would argue that we're already there. We need no look, look no further the invention of the personal computer and the iPhone. On a more basic pre-industrial level, we're alienated from each other 
because we can never really know each other, nor ourselves. We are inherent strangers to one another and mistake who we take each other to be through the projections that we bestow on one another. Whether this is fixable or not is a matter of debate and varies among existential thinkers. Some argue there is no escape. Others suggest that we are capable of bridging our estrangement through the act of love. The most basic problem, however, is our estrangement from ourselves. We don't really know ourselves any better than we know others, perhaps even less. Many people seeking therapy don't even like themselves. This alludes to the problem of authenticity and how the inauthentic person is estranged from him or herself, but needn't be, as long as he or she chooses to try their best to surmount it by recognizing it. But first they need to acknowledge how alienated they are. So what all of these terms share in common is that they're perfectly ordinary words that we use all the time. This is what made existentialism so popular in its heyday. Each of us grapples with these concerns throughout our lifetime. Any thinking person who has not experienced existential literature is nonetheless, it seems to me, a closet existentialist. She just doesn't know it. It would be difficult to be a thoughtful human being today and not be existential. Despite the variety of thinkers who are associated with an existential perspective, what is the common outlook that links them together? In the main, all of these thinkers would agree that life challenges us from the moment that we're born with pain, frustration, and disappointment, and that it confronts us with tasks that are extremely difficult to perform and that leave scars that are impossible to erase. Though as children, we're convinced things will become easier as we grow older, experience teaches us the opposite, that life becomes increasingly even more difficult, and that this state of affairs persists throughout our lifespan until we're faced with the inevitability of our own death. Now, if there is one theme that pervades just about every existentialist thinker, artist, or writer, it is that I am alone in the world. Whatever I believe awaits me after I die. And this sense of aloneness is something I cannot, nor should I deny. It is where I live in the deepest recesses of my self-identity. The ways that I cope with this aloneness makes me the person that I am and says more about me than the most detailed biography ever could. It's the basis of the despair that Kierkegaard described in The Sickness Unto Death and that every existentialist philosopher has identified with since. Is there a cure for this despair? Not really. Because despair is not a clinical diagnosis, but a fundamental aspect of my nature, it's something that will always be a part of me. Some may react to it with an increase of anxiety or depression, give up and turn to drugs or other distractions to cope with the pain of it. Others may turn to philosophy, religion, or artistic endeavors to turn their despair into something meaningful that can enrich their lives and make them more valuable and rewarding. Others still may turn to psychoanalysis or other kinds of therapy, including existential, believing that there's something the matter with them for feeling this way. Or they may recognize that they are struggling with the angst that is inherent in living and seek someone they can talk to about it. Whatever we do about it, our anxiety demands our attention and will continue to until we embrace it. Now that we've reviewed some of these basic elements of what the term existential implies, what about an existentially based form of psychotherapy? 
what distinguishes existential therapy from existential psychoanalysis? Are we talking about differences in theory and technique? Or are we talking about something closer to a kind of sensibility that characterizes a form of psychoanalysis that embodies an existential philosophical perspective? Though this is a big question, I'm gonna be brief. I'll begin with a quote from R.D. Lane in The Politics of Experience from his chapter on the psychotherapeutic experience. Quoting Lang, the irreducible elements of psychotherapy are a therapist, a patient, and a regular and reliable time and place. But given these, it is not so easy for two people to meet. Well, this seems straightforward, but enigmatic. Why, one wonders, does Lang believe it is not so easy for two people who've just entered into the most humanly intimate relationship possible to meet? After all, haven't they met already at their first session? What Lang is alluding to in this statement is not a cursory meeting. Hi, how are you? He's talking from the perspective of an existentialist. What does it take to meet genuinely, heart to heart, without defense? Lang continues, quote, we all live on the hope that authentic meeting between human beings can still occur. Psychotherapy, or I would qualify existential analysis, consists in paring away all that stands between us. The props, the mask, the roles, the lies, the defenses, anxieties, projections, and interjections, in short, all the carryovers from the past, transference, countertransference, that we use by habit and collusion, wittingly and unwittingly, as our currency for relationships." End of quote. So this for Lang is not merely the vehicle through which one engages in therapy, to genuinely engage with another person without pretense or evasion is the goal, but it's also the process. How in the world does this happen? And why is the opportunity for conducting such a meeting potentially transformative? The earliest exponents of existential analysis were Ludwig Binswanger and Metterd Boss, two Swiss psychiatrists who became part of Freud's early circle after World War I, through their association with the Swiss analyst, Carl Jung. Benzwanger and Boss were also followers of Martin Heidegger, and they independently sought to integrate the two disciplines, existentialism and psychoanalysis, into their work. Following World War II, there were many German and French psychiatrists and psychoanalysts who embraced an existential approach to psychoanalysis. Yet none of them belonged to any of the established psycholytic institutes and societies that were spreading throughout Europe, North America, and South America. Instead, they founded institutes of their own. So the term existential psychoanalyst was avoided since none of them embraced the two cardinal principles of psychoanalysis, transference phenomena and the unconscious, which is what the term psychoanalysis implies. A burgeoning number of existential psychiatrists, psychologists, and psychoanalysts subsequently exploded onto the American psychotherapy landscape after the 1960 publication of Rollo May's collection of essays by existential analyst in his volume, Existence, which introduced a generation of American clinicians to these European practitioners for the very first time. The 1960s became a kind of existential decade in America that intertwined with the counterculture, with numerous journals devoted to the cause. Most European existential philosophers and therapists translated in this work into English for the first time. 
dozens of existentially oriented analysts, including Lang and Rollo May, proliferated and were a dominant force in the 1960s psychotherapy culture, which lasted through the 70s. In fact, it was this phenomenon that inspired me to become an existential psychoanalyst. Then a strange thing happened. It disappeared. All of its founders died off, and the only practitioners left by the 1980s were Ronnie Lang and Rollo May, both existentialist as well as psychoanalyst. Somehow the culture had moved on, and the mantle of existential therapy was adopted by a new generation of therapists, principally in the UK and the US, who were hostile to psychoanalysis and rejected virtually all of its basic tenets, especially notions like transference, the unconscious, and the act of diagnosis. In their place was substituted a kind of existential nice framework, defanged of its Eurocentric post-World War II edgier and more bohemian bent. Instead of focusing on the never-ending prevalence of despair, as a fundamental feature of the human condition, this new generation of existentialists opted to market themselves in a more cheerful vernacular. Getting in touch with one's feelings became their raison d'etre. In trying to characterize how an existential psychoanalysis differs from other schools of psychoanalysis, as well as other kinds of existential therapy, Lang suggested that the distinction cannot be reduced to this or that theory or even technique. Yes, theories and techniques are important, but they are of little use when you find yourself in the presence of a person who has come to you for help. In that moment, in that encounter, you are utterly alone. Theories and techniques cannot help you. Your instincts and your heart come into play. What you call upon then is your person, the human being that you are, apart from all the theories and techniques that you've learned. You bring into play your own person that you trust totally and implicitly. For lack of a better term, Lang concluded that what is distinctive about existential psychoanalysis is a certain sensibility that we bring to bear in our work, the manner with which we engage the world. That sensibility cuts across the spectrum of all theories and techniques. Even practitioners who never studied existentialism may embody the sensibility. D.W. Winnicott, Wilfred Bion, Jacques Lacan, Harry Stack Sullivan, even Sigmund Freud, none of them existentialist, nonetheless epitomize an existential perspective through the sensibility that they bring to bear in their clinical practice. Many today argue that existentialism, and for that matter, Sigmund Freud, are pessimistic that they embody a tragic view of life when what is needed is optimism and hope. How does getting in touch with your despair help you feel better about yourself and your prospect for a better life? Well, I'm not sure there's a compelling answer to that question, or at least one that, that would persuade the critics. All I can say is that doom and gloom have not been my experience, quite the opposite. What is it that changes people? Is it insight? Is it their relationship with your therapist? What distinguishes the existential perspective from others is the odd combination of two essential criteria. First, the manner in which we connect with our patients. Second, because of that connection, our patients feel at home in this relationship and are more likely to take a risk that they had never imagined was possible. 
So in conclusion, the existentialist sensibility is nothing more than a style of engagement that is at once personal yet elusive. An existentialist based psychoanalysis is always concerned with the big picture. Not just why am I so depressed or anxious or timid or angry or miserable or neurotic, crazy. Basically, you want to take a very hard look at your life. Where is it going? Where do you want it to go? What are your unfulfilled dreams? Or do you have any? If not, why not? What is life about anyway? Why are we here? Why am I here? Who am I? Who do I wish I were? Who do I want to be? There are no definite answers to any of these questions, but our lives would have little meaning if we don't ask them. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. <clears throat> so now we've got plenty of time for uh, questions and discussion. So I just want to open it up uh, if anyone has anything that made them think about. Okay, uh, let's just say this is Michael Gutstadt and. Uh, oh, Michael, hi. Hi, hi, Michael. How are you? Just one second, I forgot to. Uh, ah, uh, sorry, forgot to uh, do. Uh, I took my denture in. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, good to see you. And I just want to thank you so much, so deeply. Um, your words really help center me and bring me back to what I feel is a meaningful perspective of life that I have drifted away from, or I drift away from moment to moment. Um, this idea of despair is really enlightening and, and hopeful, you know, and I, I understand the idea of accepting despair as part of life is just a, 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 a freeing experience. Not that I've successfully done that uh, entirely, but um, the idea is, is certainly good to hear again. And uh, it's wonderful that you brought it all together. And I think in this presentation today, you brought it together better than I've ever heard you do. I really, I really appreciate this. Uh, this is what is uh, most of this in your new book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This oh, great. Is, uh, yeah, it's all there. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> I'll look forward to that. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. What's it called again, did you say? Essays in Existential Psychoanalysis. Great, great, great. Uh, John Mills is the general editor of the uh, Rutledge Philosophy and Psychoanalysis section. So uh, oh, I have him to thank for getting this thing all, all together. Wonderful. Thank I just want to thank you very much for your presentation. I'll listen to it again, I think, yeah. So, All right. Thanks. Thanks so much, Michael. Good, good to, to see you. you. Yeah. Oh, well, if you if if nobody else is going to say anything, uh, I can't hear anybody else talking. So maybe I'll just say that um, I, I'm I'm a psychotherapist, and um, I'm sometimes faced with this problem of uh, somebody comes in and what they're really experiencing, I think, is a sense of despair. And they can't really pinpoint exactly and make it a, a concrete physical issue, which is fine. And they don't really know what it is that they're struggling with. Um, and I just find it really true that making them feel at home with that and making them feel comfortable in the room uh, discussing that in any kind of vague terms that they want to at all, I think really is crucial. And um, this helps me kind of remember that that is not a comp completely fruitless task, that uh, it makes sense to help people um, become, I'd say, comfortable with their discomfort, um, comfortable with their feeling of, well, meaningless sometimes, meaninglessness, and how we each need to create our own meaning. And that is, in a way, the, the, the point of life, I would argue. Um, and uh, despair is, is certainly um, 
a, a guide. And I, I love your a line that you said to me many years ago. I've repeated to other people that when you feel anxious, you should go toward your anxiety. <laughs> <laughs> Well, yeah, I guess a, a big problem is um, we're so well defended uh, against mm -hmm. our societies that uh, most people don't even know that they're anxious. Mm -hmm. uh, they're preoccupied with uh, unhappiness and uh, frustration, maybe depression. Um, uh, and uh, they they don't realize that anxiety is driving almost all of their behavior and, and the things that they're avoiding, especially things that are painful. Uh, but I agree with you, Michael, it's, uh, it's very, it's very challenging, isn't it? To really help people that are especially miserable. In the mm. Mm. Uh, and, uh, and I think that's where Lang's ideas about uh, connecting meeting, you know, is so important because the only thing I think I really have to offer uh, mm -hmm. people is to really be there for them. And so that they really feel like I'm, I'm hearing them and uh, sharing that moment with them. Um, of course, you know, mm -hmm. there's a problem with uh, usually with our relationships with other people and and pushing people away. So how do we surmount that? You know, how do we find a way through this uh, uh, professional relationship that's supposed to be aimed at uh, relieving symptoms to something that's really far more than that, which, which is a really heartfelt, intimate relationship with another person uh, of a very rare and unusual nature. Um, and that's where we're just flying by the seat of our pants. I, I think every one of us um, has to kind of reinvent the wheel when it comes to figuring that out. Yeah, that's a good, that's a great, great, great point. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, we next we have Brooke and then after Richard um, with their hands up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you so much for this presentation. It was wonderful and I appreciate the historical context. Uh, respectively, can you kind of describe where you think the place is for existential psychoanalysis uh, within the current, you know, climate of third wave therapy oh, and Hello. the decline? Oh, David, there you go. Um, the decline of uh, uh, psychoanalysis, which I think is actually having a little bit of a resurgence. But where do you see it fitting into the modern landscape of the work that we do? Boy, that's a big, uh, that's a big one. Um, my, you know, okay, I, I started getting involved in psychoanalysis in the 1960s. And, um, uh, you know, that's when I decided I was going to devote myself to uh, becoming an analyst. Um, so I've, I've got a fairly long arc of having observed uh, where it's evolved in the last half century on a very personal level. And my feeling is that psychoanalysis is dying uh, and uh, that it's of no real relevance anymore to culture. Uh, yes, there are institutes, there are uh, practitioners that are getting trained. Um, that, uh, that's continuing to happen. But its relationship to uh, culture, whether it's American culture or British culture or French culture, is really dying and waning. Um, and uh, it's become less and less relevant. And I think psychoanalysis has no, no one to blame but themselves. It is such an arid, rigid uh, way of teaching therapy. Uh, I'm involved with the Psychoanalytic Institute in San Francisco. I belong to the IPA, and I can tell you firsthand, nothing, nothing is improving in it. For all the rhetoric about it, uh, and that includes the relational perspective, which I, I think keeps repeating some of the same problems that you've seen over and over again, uh, the clubby, rigid, uh, mercenary kind of mindset that really drives it. Uh, and of course, another problem is the kind of person that is seeking to become a psychoanalyst today. 
uh, earlier in its history, you had to be a bit of a rebel and a renegade to become an analyst because it was not uh, a prestigious career. Uh, you know, you really had to be coming at it from the heart. Uh, well, uh, that's all changed. And, and now I, I think uh, mental health practitioners, whether they're psychologists or family therapists or social workers, seek psycholytic training uh, for prestige, to charge higher fees, to, uh, you know, uh, and uh, that, that's just not what I think uh, psychoanalysis is basically about. Uh, and um, so anyway, like I said, that's a big topic, Brooke. <laughs> uh, but um, that's all about all I can say about it now. I, I think that uh, there is some hope that when it uh, finally becomes so difficult to really justify calling yourself a psychoanalyst, because you're not gonna be seeing people multiple sessions a week, you're gonna be out there like everybody else, taking insurance, seeing people weekly, what's gonna really set you apart, that's gonna be the challenge. Uh, when it's no longer multiple sessions a week on a couch, but it's out there competing with everybody else for patients, then uh, something that was gonna change, I think, in the psychoanalytic um, paradigm. And I, I think it may at that point begin to bring in rebels again, uh, people that really wanna question uh, you know, what they're doing in, in this practice. Mm -hmm. uh, Richard. Thank you. Thank you, Michael, for this presentation. I'm very moved by what you presented. Oh, um, I'm a child of the 60s. I came to uh, awareness in the 60s as a student uh, uh, action, action um, person, political action person, before I even entered psychology. And <laughs> what I became aware of as an activist. And what I became aware of is uh, not, not so much the despair, it wasn't prevalent then, but the, uh, the terror, the terror that came with the anxiety about how, uh, how the world was gonna proceed with nuclear annihilation and the Vietnam War. That's, that was my growing up period. And um, there's a question in here somewhere, I'm coming to it. Um, it seems to me, though, that um, now, and, I, and I, I, I found my way through that period of time with the help of friends and therapy, um, but now coming fast forward uh, as a therapist now, I'm working uh, a lot primarily with young people that also have this fear of annihilation from um, uh, climate change and the ramifications of climate change. And they also, I, I feel resonance with them because of what I went through during the Vietnam War period, uh, that they're also seeking for meaning and seeking for a, a way to navigate through this very difficult time. And um, they sometimes do drop into despair, but before despair, there's this state of terror and, um, and uh, a feeling of um, meaninglessness, like we're all going to die anyway, that the world is going to be over because of climate change and what can we even do about it? And that would lead to the despair. So the question I have has to do with um, working with, with this perspective of um, that you're presenting, how to, how to bring this to the foreground as a, as a healing, uh, healing might be overblown as a way to uh, help, especially young people to address this terror that they feel about their futures and about the future of the world. I have children also in the 20s to 30s uh, era, you know, of, of life. I mean, and um, so I have direct experience of how they present to me their feelings of hopelessness about the future as well. And it, it tears at my heart. It's very personal for me. I have three children in, in that age range. And um, I feel for them and their friends and I want to be able to help. And I'm wondering how this perspective on existential psychoanalysis might, might help me to help them. I hope that's clear. 
Yeah, no, I, I understand it. Thank you so much uh, for uh, raising that because it's very relevant. Um, you know, I I don't know if uh, if things are the same now that they've always been. You know, humans killing each other. And uh, I mean, that, that's that been a perpetual aspect of world history. Uh, we're, we're always at war. And um, uh, so, you know, were things better, you know, in the past? Uh, we don't really have a good way of determining that. Uh, you know, what's the quality of life like today compared to the past? Uh, the fear of death and, uh, of course, um, the, um, whether it's uh, wars in, with Russia and the Ukraine or whether it's global warming, uh, of course, Heidegger would argue, yes, this is anxiety towards death. We're, we're all quite aware of our mortality. And in one way or the other, we each have to find a way of dealing with it. Um, uh, even if there's no wars, you're going to die. And um, and I think that we do latch on to things, you know, that go on in the media and in the world at large that maybe don't impact us directly, but we feel upset, anxious, despairing, and maybe ultimately that's that's about me. And um, uh, you know, we've always been challenged with finding a way to uh, find our own happiness, no matter how alienating and despairing things are around us. Um, I do feel that one thing that is evolving with world history, and, and this is another big topic of, Mar of uh, Martin Heidegger, is the question of technology. Of course, technology is, uh, is uh, handmade into science. And uh, in the last uh, century or so, it's just been unbelievable uh, how the world has changed. And, uh, and yet it's a double-edged sword because on the one hand, it makes our lives easier, uh, more interesting. The iPhone is now pretty much part of our anatomy. Uh, you know, somebody told me that we're basically cyborgs now because uh, we're part machine. We can't really function uh, without that. And, uh, and on the other hand, isn't this also a source of our increased alienation from each other? Um, you know, I just think back about the invention of the telephone and how, what a wonderful advance that was in modern civilization. And yet before the phone, you met people in person, you know? Uh, and our culture was uh, structured in such a way that that was happening all the time, uh, you know, and um, that's become less and less a vital part of our existence. And uh, I don't know which is worse, uh, COVID or Facebook, in terms of, um, you know, this perpetual way of, uh, of not being in proximity to other people. Uh, now look at what we're doing today. Okay, we're going to try to make lemonade with this because here we are. We're now living in a virtual universe. We're all talking to each other all over the world now through our computers. So we decided to take advantage of this with our uh, idea of uh, launching a training site that is exclusively by Zoom. Um, you know, we're not going to go uh, build a cabin in the woods and shut the world away, you know, you have to deal with the world the way it is and find your bliss, your little oasis in the context of that. And I think that's what psychotherapy over the last century or so has tried to do. You know, it's, it's, um, it's clearly replaced uh, religion as, as a means of uh, having some meaning in your life and some love and some intimacy with other people. Uh, most of my patients struggle you know, with intimacy, uh, which is why they go to see a therapist. And, um, and I think that this is uh, the biggest problem that we faced.
in, in contemporary culture? You know, how, how are we going to um, find love in our lives? Anyway, thank you uh, for that. Uh, that was a great question. Nina? <clears throat> well, before my question, I just uh, want to respond to uh, Mike's uh, sort of <laughs> remark about hope with with uh, just an anecdote. I was uh, recently at a Zoom analytic conference and I saw that, you know, when people were sort of putting where they're from, there was someone from my you know, from my home city. So I connected with them and turns out he was a, a graduate student locally and is affiliated with the whole co cohort of his fellow uh, graduate students who are very disenchanted with the lack of anything remotely psychoanalytic or psychodynamic in their training. And so they, this group of about 10 of them have sort of put together their own little uh, training community and were glad to meet me and like, where are the resources? So, you know, and these were young youngsters, you know, in graduate school. So I have a little bit of hope that, you know, there's <laughs> a younger generation who might be interested in this. The, the question that I wanted to pose was, uh, one of the things that sort of kept sort of bugging me until I sort of figured out that there was a potential conflict. And so I was wondering if you could elaborate the um, the existential the existentialist take on the role of the unconscious and how that relates or not to the concept of authenticity. Uh, thanks, Nina. Uh, yeah, that's a very apropos question, isn't it? Because uh, as I was saying in my talk, uh, the problem that all people drawn to the existential philosophical perspective um, were really troubled by Freud's conception of the unconscious and they see uh, the concept of the transference as part of that, because uh, because the way we understand transference phenomena is that it's largely unconscious. We're not aware of it happening. Um, and uh, they just can't wrap their heads around the idea of a of a hidden consciousness that, you know, so it's it's the problem of having two minds. And it's true that the way Freud lays that out uh, uh, does lend itself to that idea, a, a, a hidden subject. Uh, you know, who's really in control of me? Is, is my unconscious uh, making me do things that I'm helpless about? Well, I, I think that that um, issue is already there in existential philosophy. I think that... Um, Jean-Paul Sartre uh, certainly attacked that issue head on explicitly in uh, being in nothingness. Uh, of course, he hated the term unconscious. Uh, Maurice Merleau-Ponty, a uh, colleague of his, was a bit more forgiving and felt that the terminology shouldn't be something that gets in our way of seeing the bigger picture. And of course, uh, I think a lot of Heidegger's uh, work on being and language has shown that, uh, yes, we, we probably put too much emphasis on what we are consciously aware of in the moment, as though somehow we are really in control of our lives, um, maybe in the way that we're in control of a car that we're driving. And yet, uh, using the car analogy, You've probably noticed you're driving a car, you're having a conversation with a passenger, you're not looking at the road or paying attention to the signs, you're, you're in, involved with this conversation or you're listening to a song or audiobook. Who's driving the car? Well, that, that's living proof in my mind 
that what we call consciousness is a very small thing in the overall picture of our being, our being in the world, that we don't think our way through walking and talking and riding a bike and all the things that we're doing constantly. We're, we're doing that without what we call conscious awareness. Uh, and yet, obviously, there is some kind of consciousness. Uh, Heidegger doesn't even use the word consciousness because he thinks that's a big part of the problem. Um, we may put too much emphasis on knowing, uh, you know, what's going on, that, that you can't act if you don't know. Uh, I remember a patient of mine who once told me, I asked him uh, when he was talking about this relationship, um, if he was in love with this person. And he said, well, I don't know if I'm in love with uh, her or not, because I don't know what love is. I have to figure out what it is before I know if I can love. Now that answer really epitomizes uh, the problem with thinking that you can think your way through everything. Um, and uh, so actually I do uh, think there is uh, this unconscious thing that is really me. It's not something other than me, I am my unconscious. And, um, and my consciousness is so big and so vast and wide and temporal that it's all over the place. And thank goodness it is because I'd be lost if it wasn't. Uh, but I'm not obsessed with knowing every single thing that's going on in every single moment. And that's one reason why psychoanalysis is a retrospective device, not a prophylactic one. We're not trying to fix problems going into the future. We're trying to learn who we are by looking at our immediate past and why we did this thing yesterday or the day before or last week or 10 years ago. We're always looking, because that's how we get to know ourselves is by tracing where we've been. Looking forward, we don't really have a clue what's coming next. And that's, for some reason, um, existential therapists who reject psychoanalysis just don't seem to get that. We all have an unconscious, whether we like it or not. Anyway, that's a huge terminological problem, uh, but uh, certainly uh, Sartre and uh, Merleau-Ponty and Heidegger have all had a shot at trying to explain how you can think about this without uh, Freud's uh, particular conception of it. Okay, th thanks, Nina. I hope that helped somewhat. There's a big chapter in my new book on this topic, so you can see it there. Thanks. And we have Australia. Hi, Michael. Oh, hi, Australia. Thank you so much. It was wonderful, really great. Well, thank wonderful. You. Thank you. Uh, I was thinking about freedom, and we all want to be free. So I remember Nietzsche would say, free to do what? So what do you do with your freedom? What would you do uh, when you are free? So um, I think many people are free and they still act as herd-like and they still stick to the norm, maybe thinking they will be liked so the freedom is not really used. Um, so I was thinking about therapy, psychotherapy as a mean to um, a person to be more courageous, to, to be free to do what they really want. Um, and I was thinking what you think about this. Thank you again, Michael. Oh, thanks, Estrella. Uh... Actually, the, the topic of freedom is uh, inextricably linked to the notion of the unconscious. Um, now, of course, Sartre bases his whole philosophy on freedom. 
uh, Merleau Ponty wrote a very important chapter in the in Phenomenology of Perception on Freedom, which um, most existential philosophers think of as um, the best essay that's ever been devoted to the concept. And the biggest problem I think that we have with um, freedom as we were thinking of political freedom, not existential freedom, um, that some people are more free than others. You know, some people talk about uh, they they don't feel that they're free in their lives and they want to go into therapy and become more free as though there's degrees, you know, of freedom. Uh, and that's, of course, nonsense. Uh, I do agree with Sartre that we're all free, whether we like it or not. Uh, everything we do is our choice, uh, unconscious choice. Um, and uh, that's that's the reason psychoanalysis works, is, is because you can look back and trace the steps that you've taken in your lifetime and how you got to where you are now. And boy, you're going to learn a lot uh, doing that because you're still doing it. And, um, and you can't seem to help it either. And you might say, well, gosh, I wish I wasn't like that, or I wish I could choose differently. But actually, you are choosing the way that you want to at any given moment. Uh, it's just a bit of a mystery and a puzzle why we do make the choices that we do. It seems that very often we're acting against our best interest, uh, or we're acting out of anger or hate or frustration. And, uh, and we imagine a self that doesn't do that or is free of those kind of sentiments. Um, well, uh, all of that's free, free stuff. You know, it's, it's us coping the best we can in the world in this very, very difficult life that's been handed to us. And um, uh, we also make wonderful free choices, uh, as well as uh, some that you have to admit uh, were probably, uh, you know, not very uh, sound or rational. Uh, unfortunately, we have that irrational component to ourselves and who we are. Uh, we, we are not robots. And, um, and that's the one reason why I don't think AI is ever going to replace people because, uh, you know, you've got AI already working on the telephones and our, our iPhones. And I mean, we're already living in that world to some degree, and that will continue to evolve. Um, and perhaps in the future, there'll be uh, AI therapists that, uh, who knows, maybe some of those will be even better than real therapists. Uh, but ultimately, that person-to-person -person connection with another human is something that will always be distinctively human. And um, so I think uh, freedom goes to the heart of what it means to be free uh, human. Um, that um, otherwise robots uh, seem perfectly free, you know, uh, to do as they're programmed, uh, which is uh, not what freedom is at all. It's it's really agency, you know. It's it's uh, this is me, living my life, uh, even the, even if I don't understand why I'm living it the way that I am. Thank you, uh, Estrella. That's a great, great question. Thanks again, Mike, for great. Uh presentation of your ideas and just to put a plug in for, for for your new book i mean this is his greatest hits so uh i hope everybody uh gets a copy of it when it comes out uh this fall um yeah i just wanted to have a follow-up conversation about unconscious agency mm. like you know the notion that I don't understand why existential therapists would would disavow the unconscious, and I don't see any fundamental um, philosophical divide between um, you know an unconscious ontology and you know the question of living conscious existence. Um, 
the notion of freedom and determinism can be resolved in many ways. Like uh, uh, we make unconscious choices, as you put it. I mean, the notion of psychic determinism in Freud is not a reductionistic determinism. It it is very much uh, an agentic process where there's all kinds of possible ways that our unconscious minds could could choose certain actions, offenses, alternatives of compromise formations. And the question is, um, you know, how does that process unfold? Well, it's, it's, it's hard to know because we can't directly observe what's happening. The, you know, some of the closest things that we can observe is like uh, dreaming. How, how many of us like are aware of our dream states at night? And then we're trying to understand where is it happening? And then at the same time, it seems like we're, we're not the actor here. We're, we're observing things. And, and yet we can direct how this might happen, where it's going to go, where the narrative, the drama, whatever. And so that, to me, uh, shows some unconscious agency operative, even though I might feel a, a bit estranged as a subject from what's happening in my dreamscape. So I, I just wanted to see if you had any further follow-ups on that. Well, I, I think the biggest problem that we have with this notion of uh, unconscious uh, freedom is that we associate choice not with freedom, but with what I'd call volunteerism. Uh, you know, that, um, yes, if you're threading a needle you're totally focused on on the needle and the thread and in a very deliberate way you're trying your best to get that little thread inside that tiny little hole and uh, that takes all of your attention and all of your effort and everything you've got in that moment and then we we take that example and we we pretend that that's how we're living our life that we're all busy threading needles, you know, every moment of the time, and that that's um, somehow to be conscious. Um, and um, that's not where we live. You know, yes, we, we do have the capacity for bringing our attention to bear very deliberately and specifically in a moment. But does that mean that we are deliberately choosing every single thing that we say and everything that we feel. Uh, what, what we actually do when we're engaging with a person is much bigger than deliberation. It, we're just flying by the seat of our pants. We're just, uh, it's all happening way too fast to be deliberate about it. Uh, if we're lucky, we can remember, you know, what we're doing. Uh, to a good degree, and uh, and that's where we begin to kind of have a have a hang on. Oh yeah, I, I heard th this is how I got here. You know, I decided to go out tonight. You know, um, so uh, you have to let go of the idea that you are ahead of your choices. You know, uh, you know, pulling them along behind you when actually we're always behind our choices, always discovering what our choice was right after we made it. And again, that's why analysis is retro, uh, reflective, retrospective rather than prophylactic. We're always trying to catch up with where we're going. That's where our freedom lives. Mm -hmm. And you know, we have very little in the, uh, of course, control over uh, what we're feeling and doing. That's something else people confuse with freedom is that if we're free, we have control over our lives. We have no control over our lives. That's a complete myth. Uh, we're just coping the best we can. And all of that is doing it freely, even if we hate uh, our freedom, our free choices. Hmm. We all do them for a reason. Betty. Betty. <laughs> <laughs> 
I can't figure out how to make the device work <laughs> anyway. I'm technologically impaired. Anyway. Yeah, you're still uh, living in the 20th century, Betty. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I can't wait for the chapter on the unconscious. Um, I was just thinking about Sartre because, um, you know, of course, the idea of pre-reflective consciousness is his answer. He's, he doesn't see it as as a, an act of will. And he... Um, and he um, and he doesn't think that he's t he thinks that what's what we know on an intellectual level is a very small part of it. That what we do on a pre-reflective level, on a bodily the level of bodily lived experience, is where it's at. So, um, you know, I I anyway, I'm I'm going to be fascinated to hear what you say. You know, uh, in that chapter. So well, thanks, Betty. By the way, those of you who don't know Betty. Uh... Betty Cannon wrote an amazing book, Sartre and Psychoanalysis, some years ago, uh, that delved into Sartre's whole relationship with psychoanalysis. It's a fantastic resource. I highly recommend it. Um, that was when when was that published, Betty? That was um, it was published in 91. 91, yes, yes. Anyway, it's still a fantastic book. Yeah, I was also thinking about the Freud scenario because that's a very, very um, sympathetic to Freud's discovery of the unconscious, uh, excessively long screenplay that Sartre wrote for John Huston, you know. Yes, yes, yeah. Those of you who don't know, uh, Sartre wrote a screenplay. John Huston wanted to make a movie about Freud, and uh, it, it, it didn't work out because Sartre's uh, screenplay would have taken 10 hours to film. And yeah. when Houston complained about the length of it, Sartre went back and made it even longer. Yes. Uh, so, yes. so Houston couldn't really use it. Um, but yes. Sartre was very fascinated with Freud. Yes. Uh, yes. And recognized, uh, okay, this guy's really a thinker. He's come up with some very original ways of looking at the mind, and he's got a whole theory of how to heal people. And Sartre, um, even though Sartre was never in psychoanalysis himself, he, uh, he was really intrigued and fascinated with Freud, the theoretician. Uh, and uh, quite rightly, I mean, uh, Freud was cutting edge thinking in the beginning of the 20th century. Yeah, um, I think it was uh, Pantoli who said that Sartre had an, that Sartre's relationship with Freud needed to be looked at because it was an equally equally um, attraction and repulsion, uh -huh. equal elements of attraction yeah. and repulsion, yeah. and that maybe his whole philosophy needed to be reevaluated in light of it. I didn't try to do that in my book, by the way. I tried to look at. Uh, what psychoanalysis might be able to learn from Sartre. But. Yeah, I do have a chapter on uh, Sartre and psychoanalysis in my new book. Um, okay. Great. Uh, but Merleau-Ponty uh, was much more sympathetic to Freud. He was married to a psychoanalyst, so that helped. Uh, and he also taught child psychology at the Sorbonne. Uh, so uh, Merleau-Ponty had one foot in psychology and another one in philosophy. So, so he had a much better grasp of Freud reading between the lines and realizing that, you know, you, you can't get too caught up in the technicalities of it. Uh, but he was a huge, huge Freud fan. And he was uh, going to write a book on Freud when he died. Yeah, yeah. 